going to hear today from um, Ari Feldman, who is the VP of Global Compliance and Strategy at Medidata. Um, Ari's been a longtime supporter and Medidata has been as well. So Ari is gonna give a, a short presentation on the topic, which is tech-enabled clinical trials. And then we're gonna have a discussion. And I really mean a discussion. It's, it's truly meant to be interactive. This is meant to be like interesting and fun, instructive for you. So sometimes people get a little bit nervous asking questions, which is fine. You, but you know, raise, either raise your hand or maybe better um, put it in the chat box. And then once we open it to Q&A and discussion, um, I'll just try and call on folks. Um, so with that, I, Ari, as I said, is, has been at Medidata as VP uh, Global Compliance and Strategy for four years. Prior to that, he was at PwC for 16 years. And he is an expert in this area, which is why we are excited to have him talk about it. There's obviously a lot going on in this area. So thank you again. I'm gonna turn it over to you, Ari, and uh, look forward to the discussion. So thanks for that intro. Um, and um, as, as Bunny said, you know, I've been at Medidata for just coming on four years. Um, and prior to that, I, I grew up at PricewaterhouseCoopers and my background is really in governance, risk and controls. Um, and so I look at pharmaceuticals, I look at the, 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 the clinical trial landscape, the health sciences landscape, not necessarily from an industry veteran perspective who's worked in the you know, big pharma space, um, but really from uh, you know, controls. And um, what is it about uh, the, the pharma space where there's a lot of uh, hesitancy that we know that it's a very regulated environment. Um, and, and as Bunny said, I spent my time at PwC and I've really been across a variety of industries. And perhaps my view on, on, um, on, on the life sciences space uh, is, is quite, um, I'll call it, um, colored by my experiences across other industries. And so I look towards uh, regulation as not uh, a necessary evil, but um, when you have that regulation and you have to put the controls around it, how do you uh, look towards leveraging those controls to, to further and better business? And so in coming on to this, this chat today, and by the way, it's meant to be just out of chat. So um, uh, Anand and, and uh, Buddy can mon monitor the chat room. Um, and if there's something that you, you've got, you can raise your hand virtually or, or I don't know, wave at your video and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll gladly stop. Um, there's obviously we'll dedicated put it in chat. Okay, cool. Um, there's, um, there's, there's, and stop me, Bunny, because I, I got too many things going on here. So um, um, there's, um, there's obviously going to be dedicated Q and A time at the end. So. Without further ado, today's topic really speaks to itself. Um, Tech-enabled clinical trials will recent regulatory changes take. And I'd like to start here with um, some numbers. So this is, uh, the, the numbers on the left were from a study that was, was published by the CDC and talks about um, hospital room uh, emergencies. And these slides will be uh, circulated and you can uh, see the, the reference link. So you see that, um, they were talking about three major um, conditions, well-known conditions, and they were talking about reduction in, in emergency room visits uh, during a 10-week period since the start of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And I found this to be quite interesting because um, obviously there's, there's a reduction in visits. Uh, what's driving at this? Uh, and, and concurrently, when you look on the right, uh, Medidata has done a study um, based on data because we're, you know, based on the data of, of studies within our platform, uh, we, can t we can tell um, the, the reduction in, in new subject enrollment within a, a clinical trial. And you can see that that's down uh, 30%. And so um, what's driving these numbers down? Um, we can possibly say that, you know, people are afraid to go to hospitals or afraid to leave their house. They're afraid of the, of the, of the pandemic. Um, but what I found starkly uh, in contrast was when you look at um, these three conditions on the left, the number of uh, 
ER visits or hospital visits. And by the way, that was based on uh, ICD code. So, uh, you know, obviously it's not a perfect number, but again, directionally, I think it's, it's probably accurate. Um, and the, the blood, the um, diabetic related emergencies didn't have as much of a reduction. And perhaps the reason for this is, is that the signs and symptoms for heart attacks and strokes very much mirror that of what we've seen with COVID. I mean, they've basically said every condition, every sign and symptom can, can be COVID, you know, shortness of breath, diaphoresis, um, you know, high, high um, you know, elevated pulse, fever, et cetera. But when you look at diabetes, those are patients that have uh, technology and tools at their fingertips and are acutely aware of the conditions which would require a hospital visit. And so perhaps what we're seeing here is where technology has played a role. That is to say, you have basic things like a blood glucose meter, where, um, which is a device and a software on it, which is considered to be a device. Um, so by all intents and purposes, it's a piece of technology. Um, those patients are able to kind of watch what's going on and drive their, um, you know, and, and not be necessarily afraid to go to the hospital because they know that they need to go. So um, what I see in here is this further underscores the need to have uh, technology enabled clinical trials, because if we have the ability to within the, the clinical trial um, ecosystem to um, work with patients remote in a remote perspective, not necessarily on site um, and not necessarily with, you know, direct monitoring, et cetera. And I'll come on to a few examples uh, shortly. Perhaps that will, will, will help the clinical trial uh, landscape. So, Taking it forward, what's the um, regulatory perspective? So we're clearly working uh, in a disconnected global landscape. Um, there's clear lack of harmonization uh, on the regulatory requirements. So interestingly, the European Union recently released a pharmaceutical strategy document and Medidata and some of the folks on my team participated in a workshop held by the, the, the European Commission. And the EU in and of itself recognizes that it is lagging in terms of technology and clinical trials and that there's lessons to be learned from COVID-19. Um, now, on the stark contrast to that, the EMA, when they put out their guidance, said their guidance ends when the COVID-19 pandemic ends. So I don't know how those two reconcile with one another, but You've got the EU saying one thing and the EMA saying, uh, the, you know, the EC saying one thing and, and the EMA saying another thing. Um, not a surprise. So there is an acknowledgement within that pharmaceutical strategy document that science and, and technology uh, need to be embraced uh, with a patient-centered focus. Um, and there is also a consensus to read within that document th that there's a need to redraft regulatory frameworks to accelerate drug development, um, despite the fact that the EU and everyone, I think that's a, sort of a given, um, remains very fragmented in their approach. And by contrast to the EU, you've got the FDA who departed from their normal process of issuing a draft guidance, having a comment period, and then um, drafting, you know, sending out their guidance. They issued their, their guidance. They said, we know we didn't do a draft period. We want your feedback and we'll keep redrafting. And uh, I've counted no, no fewer than six times over the course of a four month period that, um, that there was a response to, uh, to industry feedback and tweaking um, both their, their guidance as well as adding Q&A to it. So just taking practically how we see a fragmented approach um, so within the EU, we know there's a fragmented approach. Um, let me just kind of draw a contrast between, let's say, what's happening in the U.S. and what's happening in the EU. Um, and similarly, I just use those two as an example. Similarly, in Asia, uh, whether it be Japan, China, Singapore, et, et cetera, um, if we think about things, basic things such as informed consent, the FDA has provided a clear path to its use. Uh, the EU has said we approve of it, but you should work within national um, provisions and, and, and um, 
and uh, within the national legal framework, and then goes ahead and acknowledges that national provisions and approaches differ. We've done, at Medidata, we've done a, a, an analysis. We didn't just do an analysis. We reached out to almost every country within the, the European Union to get um, a regulatory statement on uh, electronic informed consent, and it's incredible how disparate it is in terms of what it can be used for, which frankly is quite limited, um, and who and, and, and which organizations, uh, um, you know, sort of which uh, um, countries do allow it. Save for the... Um, the UK, which I know is not part of the EU anymore, um, save for, for the UK, uh, it's really not an accepted practice um, sort of globally uh, within the EU. So um, what are the technology opportunities? But before I go forward, what is certainly acknowledged in every regulatory document that I've seen is, is two points. There's, there's absolutely universal agreement. One is that patient safety remains paramount, undoubtedly, right? Patient safety is, is at the forefront. And the, with regard to clinical trials, reasonable steps should be taken to avoid halting clinical trials as there remains a need for patients to receive criti uh, critical treatments. So we've got these two, what I view as sort of cornerstones. Um, they are absolutely critical points. But then when you get down into the practicality, whether it be because of a force from industry or a force from regulatory agencies, um, we don't see as much wide adoption as one would, uh, as one would think. So let's look at the technology side of things. Um, so I mentioned my background in, in governance, risk and controls and the way I look at that and, and what the sort of the, the way I've practiced at Medidata and, and kind of move forward in the business is we're not going to wait for regulators to issue guidance. We're going to let the data lead and make decisions based on that using a true risk-based approach. Um, a good example of that is, you know, sort of, and I, I hate to use buzz terms, but sort of this idea of real world evidence. I do think that there's, there is a huge future in that. I think that there, what I've seen from some of our clients, um, what I've heard it at various uh, uh, engagements with regulators is there's a lot of waiting for guidance. There is also a lot of moving, moving forward, but there's a lot of waiting for guidance. And I don't think we're going to see sort of clear guidance and there's going to be lots of questions. And um, what's the wait? I think, and, and the approach that we've taken is let's look at what makes sense and let's go with the rebuttable presumption that if you can put in a framework and you can manage the risk accordingly, whether it be around consent, whether it be around monitoring, whether it be around drug supply, then technology can certainly lead. Um, and we can move away from um, the, a risk aversion approach um, where we're where all areas of a clinical trial, and I use clinical trial as an example, but it's really anything in the health, health and life sciences space, um, where all of all those areas are taken equally, um, whether it, you know, and, and I don't view all of those uh, areas to be, to be, uh, to be equal, right? Uh, the impact uh, of, a, of incorrect drug supply is going to be uh, on a patient and patient safety is going to be an, an advancement of perhaps curing diseases is going to be very different than um, someone not signing off on a document in a timely manner, but everything in, 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 in the content of it was done on time. Let me just, so let's look at the tech side. Um, I wanna highlight four areas where the regulatory easing, and I've, I'm using that term very specifically with regard to COVID has proven to be very effective for clinical trials. Um, and I know the topic is what will stick. I, if I had that answer, if I knew that answer, if I knew which technology would lead, um, if I knew which solution would lead in terms of these areas, uh, and this is just four examples, like we can go on and on, right? I'm sure everyone on the, on the phone has, uh, has examples that they can provide. Um, I don't know what's going to stick, but something has to stick because the data stick stands for itself, right? So let's take site visits. Um, there, there is a longstanding practice that you need to go to a, a site to complete a form. Um, 
And now there is a pretty much wide acceptance to complete forms with uh, electronic collection. Um, because the agencies, um, the, the authorities have recognized that people require, people need to be in quarantine. They might actually be in quarantine in a hospital. And so to be in quarantine in a hospital and not be able to administer a clinical trial, and that hospital theory could be, even be a site. Um, so to, to have a patient who's part of a trial, who's in quarantine in a hospital for COVID and not receive um, medication because we can't, um, we can't do, um, you know, they can't get to the site in the traditional way. Um, site visits can now be done sort of remotely. And we've seen um, uh, telemedicine t uh, kick in there. Um, and we've also seen, frankly, telemedicine kick in on, on the clinical side as well. Um, I know at first, for example, insurers weren't going to pay um, to the same rates. And then I think they did. And then they changed it. And there's been, I actually just saw a headline last night that I think there's, there's some sort of executive order that was on the table around, uh, around telehealth. Um, not, not for clinical trials per se, but for clinical. Um, and again, I, I think that's something that we're seeing change dramatically. Uh, another area, so the next area here is monitoring. Um, source data review has been a hot topic uh, within clinical trial ecosystems forever. Um, and whether it can be performed, whether and how it can be performed effectively via remote solution has, has long been a debate. And so like in, in this example, uh, Medidata has, has introduced a remote, remote source document review um, solution which it's, regularly comp it's regulatorily compliant, it de-identifies, it manages and reviews, um, you know, enables someone to review, criti review critical study documents. So here's a case of where monitoring has really shifted the paradigm um, from sort of 100% um, to really taking on a risk-based approach. And if I, if I zoom out in a second, for a second here, and I just talk about risk-based approach, I see that in everything that I do, in every interaction that I have uh, with, with Medidata's customer base, um, it's, I can see firsthand the difference in um, risk tolerance from not just one company to another, but within the companies themselves, right? So um, your clinical data managers might take a different view than your procurement team um, or than your business ops team um, just because of history and what they're looking forward, uh, you know, looking towards. So um, that, and, and frankly, this is not something uh, I was, I was servicing the financial services industry um, at the time of Sarbanes-Oxley when Sarbanes-Oxley came around and that, that was the, the, the Sarbanes-Oxley legislation was the result of sort of the Enrons of the world where there was financial fraud committed, and this was meant to introduce some financial oversight. And uh, this risk aversion um, or approach to risk, I should say, is not, is not new. Uh, I saw it then, and so to see it now is, is, uh, is, is not a surprise. The question is, has COVID caused enough of a stir, both within the regulatory authorities, as well as more importantly within industry, to drive change? I mentioned consent. I'll touch on it again briefly. Um, it, it's it's never been easier than it is today with remote collection of of data. You can use an impartial witness, and even though um, electronic informed consent in its in its uh, full uh, you know has not been kind of um, allowed within the EU's sort of you know remit, they have allowed certain things to take place in terms of having an impartial witness, sending an email, faxing, etc. Who knew that in 2020 someone was going to actually reference fac facsimile as a means of, uh, of, uh, of of communicating? But hey, I still have one in my house. I still use it, and I guess it's come in handy a few times uh, as I've been uh, as I've been home. And then the last area to me is is probably um, the the most fascinating in terms of drug supply. Uh, drugs historically uh, for clinical trials were sent to sites to administer to patients, and now what we're seeing is, um, you know, the the uh, the drug the, the drug supply can be sent directly to the patient. Uh, you know, parenthetically, you know, in all these cases, and this is no exception, Medidata's systems have been retooled to enable uh, direct to patient, um, you know, shipments. So I, I think we've seen 
industry drive, we've seen regulators come out with need for change, and we've seen industry based on their questions uh, uh, drive, uh, drive changes to the way they're doing things. Uh, this has gone all the way from um, protocol revisions, the way adverse events are reported, um, and, and of course, drug supply. So um, I'll just, a lot of what I said, and I think Bunny and, and Anand had sent this out beforehand, um, we're now on version 7.0, and I think 8.0 is due to be really soon of, of the metadata perspective. Um, I, I find this to be quite an interesting read. It talks about uh, not just, it, it, it gives a very uh, well-rounded approach, um, including the regulatory, but also has some very interesting and fascinating data that keeps getting updated related to uh, study enrollment and clinical trials and how sort of the curves have gone um, globally. Um, and also, of course, talks about some of the, it, it introduces some of the ideas of where technology can play a, a critical role um, in, in addressing uh, uh, changes to, to ongoing or, or starting new trials. And the right, uh, that's, that's Medidata's blog. That's a link to Medidata's blog where uh, myself and, the, and my extended team have been keeping an update. Um, it's quite a challenge as the uh, uh, agencies, as the authorities come out with new guidance um, to kind of sift through it, find out what that is, and then make those updates. So we've been keeping that updated. It does give a global viewpoint um, to the extent that that's reasonable and possible. It doesn't go to every single country. I think we kept it to the G20, um, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, it, it has been a challenge because uh, like when the FDA comes out with their guidance, they don't say what's changed. They just sort of make the change and you've got to compare, you've got to figure out how to do a red line from one to the other. So I, I find we've gotten a lot of positive feedback on, on both of these documents, particularly as I interface with um, um, both the business side as well as the quality and regulatory folks. Um, just on the on the regulatory position. So hey, um, Ari. Yeah. It says geeks talk clinical. You're not a geek. I didn't name the blog. I I, I, sus I suspect that that was something that dates back to uh, to Lincoln. when uh, yeah. to to, to okay. Glennon team. But that's Medidata's blog. It's called Geeks Talk Clinical. Yeah. Um, I, I, plenty of people think I'm a geek. Um, I don't have <laughs> any chest pockets, so there's no pocket protector today. But maybe I would have put one on. Um, if it's I, okay. If well, yeah. it, it, you've given a great overview, um, and we did send the resources out. Maybe we can start opening it up to discussion and Q&A. I know, um, Terrence, you, uh, you just posted a question, so why don't you unmute yourself and, uh, and ask it? Sure, sure. I'm here. Can you hear me okay? Sure can. Yeah, we can. I mean, again, I'm just going to stress, if people would put their video on, if you can, it's a lot more interesting, but if you can't, that's fine. So go ahead. Okay, I'm gonna put it on here. Don't be startled. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Um, so hi, Ari, thank you for this. This is really helpful. And um, so, you know, you mentioned a, a lot about regulation and, I, and you did also mention those other four areas that you see as opportunities. So, you know, in a simplistic form, the, for, for those that participate in clinical trials, the key challenge is convenience, right? Being able to get to wherever the, the clinical trial sites are. And, um, and then on the other side, it's those that um, with remote, um, being able to control the, the patients, whether they're taking the medication and, and doing measurements and, and so forth. So how do, we, how do we achieve both of those, both the convenience so more people are participating in clinical trials because why not? Um, it's it's something that's easy, easier to do, but also the it doesn't negatively impact the results because they are still a controlled environment or controlled setting. Yeah, so so it's a question we get regularly. I think it's um, I, there's so much. So there's when I look at technology, I think technology comes under. I'll I'll put two parts to it, right? Technology, there's going to be certain regulated technologies, such as things like a blood glucose meter. That's a regulated technology. And then there's other technologies like, you know, um, uh, that are not that are not necessarily um, um, commercial grade or not necessarily regulated, but can be used to kind of watch in the environment. So, for example, um, you could you could very easily enable 
um, a video chat well and watch someone take their blood pressure right so you've shipped them up we're not even asking them if you want to even zoom that out and say i'm not even asking you to go to cvs and buy a a, a blood pressure cuff i'm going to ship you a blood pressure cuff right um, one that's acceptable for for you to use and i can even watch you taking your blood pressure and i can even read that blood pressure right so um i, I you know so let me just let me just call them some of my personal experience um in in i don't share this too too uh, too oddly but um for the past 25 plus years, I've been a, an, an emergency medical technician in New York State. And so I, I ride ambulances all the time. Um, as a volunteer, I do it for fun. Um, you can very easily tell patients that really know what they're doing from what they're kind of a little more clueless and need a little more assistance and guidance. And I think that that's probably evident at sites as well. If we can harness that information and say, you know what, we know this patient might need a little bit more hand holding or watching or whatever versus this patient, you can take, I think, Terrence, it's reasonable to start taking a risk based approach to saying, okay, this person has had this disease for this number of years, they're under control. We might need to, maybe the, the level of monitoring and how we're, we're looking at that is going to, I don't use monitoring with a capital M, but you know, sort of oversight, right? It might be different than this patient who was just recently diagnosed or who is in a category where using a tablet might be more difficult or, or the like. So I do think that those two can very easily be mar married up. That said, I don't think that technology will totally replace um, the need for certain things to take place in person, right? I mean, that's, I think that's probably where we're headed you know, that's where my children or grandchildren will be at. Um, but I don't think that that's, that's where we're at today. I think that there is an absolute opportunity to start in infiltrating more of these types of things into the, into the, uh, the you know, sort of the day-to-day -day interactions. Can I do a quick follow? follow? Yeah, sure. So do you, do you agree, Ari, with my statement that it is convenience? I, I was just thinking as you were answering that to some extent it's awareness. Like I've, I can't tell you how many people I've heard who maybe had COVID and recovered, who said, I would happily be part of a clinical trial. Um, but they're not going out there and looking for it. They don't know about trials that are happening. Do you think there's also an awareness piece that is really important or, or other factors that I, that, you know, besides convenience and awareness? I do think, so when I joined MediData, I was actually surprised by the fact that awareness of clinical trial, that one of the major issues in clinical trials is enrollment right? Identifying patients and enrolling them. And when you start to kind of peel that away, one of the, uh, there's other reasons why people might not be aware of a clinical trial, but I do think it is convenience, right? If someone who is a, um, you know, is, a, is, a, is an oncology patient and they need to go to a site, you know, I take it for granted that I live in the Metro New York area and there's probably sites for more, most clinical trials within a relatively short radius to my, to my house. But for majority of people, that's not the case, right? So I do think that uh, one is the awareness and two is if I'm a physician in, you know, in some rural area, um, I don't think it's going to be feasible for this relatively sick patient to get to a site. So I'm not even going to tell my, 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 my patient about it, right? Um, and I might, as a physician, I might not be aware of it. So awareness is certainly an issue, but I don't think, uh, Terrence, that we're that's not an, an issue that tech necessarily technology is solving. I think that uh, with technology on the backside of that will come the increased, you know, the opportunity for increased awareness, because if I don't have to go to a site, if I don't have to leave my house for a lot of, um, you know, a lot of activities that I could otherwise do um, within my own home, right. Um, but what, and even, even in clinical, right. Uh, People are now getting um, physical therapy with, tele with telemedicine visits, right? I mean, things that, you know, the, one would have thought the, 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 they have to be in the therapist's office, et cetera. So I do think those two are connected. I just don't think that, that one is going to drive, that, that, that there's a direct um, correlation between the two. Okay. Uh, if, I, if you don't mind me jumping in a little bit here, um, I've had some experience in this area, and I've seen a couple of situations where technology has made a big difference in recruiting, identifying and recruiting patients. Uh, I've worked with uh, uh, Mayo Clinic and uh, using electronic medical records systems, we were able to pre-screen, pre-identify patients 
so that um, physicians, when they are meeting with their patients, can um, evaluate whether or not a particular study or a group of studies might make sense for that patient. Which brings me to the next point, and that is, um, in my experience, one of the, if not the most uh, important aspects of recruiting patients into study is the physician, him or herself. Um, the relationship with that physician is the number one reason why an individual will go into a study. I'll, there are a couple of outliers, there's some smoking cessation, et cetera, which people are constantly looking for ways to um, you know, sort of enroll in studies and find a way to break those habits. But generally speaking, um, um, overwhelming evidence shows that a relationship between the patient and the physician, uh, in, you know, the physician is the sole or primary reason why the patient will enroll in a study. I would agree. Makes sense. You know, the continued, and you know, Gary, on that point, the continued care, right? Um, does me enrolling in a clinical trial mean that my physician, whom I've had a relationship with for and who I trust, et cetera, does that mean that physician is going to cease to have sort of general oversight, right? Am I going under someone else's care? So I do believe relationships are, are, are absolutely uh, key. And I do think, again, technology has an opportunity to play here. What's, what, again, remains to be seen is how much of this is, is there going to be a view that we're seeing like in EMEA where there's a clear statement of the, our guidance ceases to exist, ceases to be effective once the pandemic um, is declared over. Um, and I, that, that view, I think, could also very well change. Hey, um, thanks, Gary. Good to see you. Um, Ivor, you've been posting furiously. This is great. I can't keep up here. No, no, no. Well, Ivor, are we got to unmute him? No, I'm, can you hear Oh, me? great. Yeah, yes, I, we can I see you. your statement. Yep. Yeah. Well, wait, let him talk. Let him say it. So, the, the two, well, one comment I think was already mostly commented on. I'm just thinking about what about five years from now? Where are the, where's the horizon over the horizon that we could be thinking about now, especially if this pandemic goes? We're having trouble hearing you, I think. Okay, I don't. That's well, great. That's good. We can. So I'm thinking about what's the horizon, what's just over the horizon that is in the next few years, such as augmented reality and that sort of things, very rich sensor data, streams of sensor data that would be subject to machine learning or AI. These things are obviously somewhat in the future, but they must, someone's working on them, they have to be. And then this physiotherapy question. Some of the uh, virtual physiotherapy companies are like the virtual version of in-person physiotherapy without all the diathermy and the machines and everything. And others are experimenting with putting sensors on the patient's body. I think Hinge Health might be one of them and Sword Health maybe is another. There's probably a couple of them. And then the, not only can the actual real physiotherapist analyze the patient's movements, uh, but an AI probably is could be helping them do that. I don't know if the an AI is, is helping them do that, but it could be. And so if you're doing a physio, I mean, physiotherapy is like all over the map for, in terms of maybe it prevents things and, you know, surgeries and maybe it doesn't. Well, maybe the variation is more in how it's done and what the patient is doing and how engaged they are than it is in physiotherapy because it's not like taking a statin. You know, where it's either, once you've taken it, it's gonna do whatever it does biologically. You need more, a lot more engagement in these kinds of things. Thoughts? A lot there. <laughs> um, sensors is a big topic. So I, so I I don't know that I could say what's what's in the longer term horizon other than that just the way the world is going I could definitely see you know you've you've seen big commercial players come out with um, more and more and more sensors and data that are available to uh, to uh, to folks the question is, to individuals the question is whether that will be accepted as whether that data will be acceptable to within the clinical trial space I think that's only a matter of time so longer term absolutely in my view it's just it's it's inevitable right um, the, 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 there's more data available to um, to individuals and for analysis being produced every second of the day than there has ever been um, globally 
S sensors is a is a place where metadata focuses as well, um, and incorporating sensors into the the clinical trial per, uh, specifically. Um, so I I think that sensors absolutely has a future. Uh, again, it goes back to uh, a big future. Uh, I think it it goes back to what is going to be the ex and and what's going to be the acceptable um, technology that can be used for said sensors, and there was a push and pull here. So I was, um, I was in a, um, a meeting with Scott Gottlieb, Dr. Scott Gottlieb, just, it was right after he had tendered his resignation as the commissioner of the FDA. So he was still officially in office, but he had just tendered his resignation. So I guess he could speak a little unfettered. And um, he, 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 there was, it was some industry folks in the room and he was positing. So obviously the industry folks were positing we need more clarification from the agency as to what is and what is not, you know, sort of the guidelines. And he was positing, well, we'd like to see industry come forward. We've given, we've given frameworks, not prescriptive guidelines. We'd like to see industry come forward with some ideas and then we can have a dialogue um, about acceptability and plans, et cetera. So you can see there's this push and this pull. And although that was a one-to-one, -one, I think it's, it's probably um, from our experience, it's, it's the, it's, um, it's, uh, you know, just that's the case all over the world. I'll, re I'll, I'll reference, um, Bunny, if I may, uh, a recent interaction we have with the Singapore HSA, the, the health, uh, health Authority in Singapore. They really weren't aware of the power of electronic informed consent. Um, you know, and the ability to use a tablet and what that means and how that would impact. So just some of it, and I, I go back to uh, Terrence, your comment of just awareness. Patients might not be aware, physicians may not be aware, and regulators alike might not be aware. So. And then we're, we're going to have to be the leaders here. 100%. I agree. Hi. Hey, um, Ashish? Yes, yeah. hi. hi. Great. Um, hey, how are you? Good. Um, Actually, you know what would help everybody? I forgot to say. Introduce yourself and like, yeah. do. what's your relationship here? Um, so I run a healthcare AI startup here in Princeton, and uh, we primarily focus until COVID on an helping analyze and build uh, AI algorithms for surgical procedures, orthopedic, cardiovascular, and so on and so forth. Um, since COVID, uh, surprisingly, uh, I got a lot more requests from pharma companies, naturally, and uh, we did onboard our first CRO for running, uh, I wouldn't call it tech enabled, but more like remote data monitoring clinical trial for pulmonary diseases. The part which was very difficult to uh, implement was getting past the regulatory. And I would like to chat with some experts offline on that. But the biggest hurdle once we passed the regulatory piece was actually bringing technology in the implementation. So the doctors were not ready for a newer technology. The patients, was it was very difficult to train them uh, once the technology was built in because they have to capture the data. And it was a big, big eye opener for both the CRO and the sponsor because it cost them a lot of money and they just did not plan for that at all. So my question is, these are going to be real practical challenges for just about everybody, physicians, patients, sponsors, sites. And are, are these big challenges being accounted as part of the planning itself? Because they're not part of the regulation. Nobody cares about what the patients does. The cost for training a patient remotely. Um, so what are your thoughts? And I know technology is great. I mean, they came to us because we're an AI company, but when it came down to actually capturing data, they ended up doing it on a phone, so. Yeah, so I'm not a psychologist, but I'll answer with a little bit of, a bit of a, a psychological answer, because I see this, we see this all the time. The idea of patient burden and site burden, right? Um, and for those whose videos are on, I can see some, some you know, head nodding on that. Um, we can't introduce uh, this technology because the patients in this are at a class where, um, where you know, 
trying to get them to their previous generation, trying to get them to use an iPad is, or, or an Android device is going to be a challenge. I got news for you. Many, many, many people have um, in, in, I, I, in my, in my, you know, general walk of life, I've seen plenty of people who are 80 plus, and I'm not picking that number for any reason other than, you know, it's a, it's a nice age, um, who are using their tablets just as fine. And I've seen plenty of people who are, you know, you know, 22 and can't figure out how to, how to do something more basic than make a phone call off of their device. But my psychological, my psychology answer to that is nobody, the human nature doesn't deal well with change, but change has to happen. Right. And there has to be an investment uh, in order for change to happen. Right. Um, so whether that and that investment, I think, is going to come from industry and it's going to come from the patients. Right. Um, but but once that change goes through, that's going to be in the rearview mirror. Look at look at what's happened to COVID. Right. Look how the again, look how the news media not in what they're reporting, but how they're reporting. That's an industry where reporting from re reporting from home was never, ever, ever happening. You just didn't, you just didn't see it. And now, uh, you know, the big question one day I saw, and I, I, I don't, it was going around each of the media outlets is, are you wearing pants, right? Because people are adapting to what needs to happen. And was that change and was that move from being in the studio to being at home easy? Probably not, um, but you see that ad adoption happening. The question everyone's asking, I'm no different, is what's going to revert afterwards? Is the remote r remote working going to kind of kind of keep its its pace, right? And or is it going to kind of revert to in office, need to have meetings, need to travel, etc.? I don't think clinical trials are any different, and I think that Ashish, if we can move towards adopting technology, yes, the pain is here now, but longer term, it will not be there. It simply won't be there. Do other people have thoughts on that? I, a quick thought for me. Um, I, I think it's something that gets to- Hey, both Matt, the just say who you are and like what your background is. Sorry, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Matt Feldman, uh, communications consultant formerly in the uh, clinical trial, uh, clinical uh, research association uh, space and, and now a, a consultant and, and professional communicator. Um, and I and no relation. And no and relation. No, and no relation to <laughs> um, although there's no, nothing I planted here, guys. Don't I don't want anyone to come, come up with any conclusions. Though I, I've worked with Matt professionally, we have absolutely no relationship, no uh, no familiar relationship whatsoever. But one thing that I think integrates both what Ari's saying and comments from Ashish and Terence and Gary is that communications is often sprinkled on at the end. And it's not enough for this technology to simply to build it and, and hope people will come, that the doctors will come, that the patients will come, that we have to effective, more effectively communicate why it's there and what its power is, both to the regulators, to the physicians, to, to have communications be a central tool to be seen equally at the table along with the technology. It's, it, it's, it's self-evident to some people, but it is not uh, self-evident to everyone. And, and I think that we have to invest uh, in communications to help spark that and to help bring that along and, and help keep keep parity uh, it just it seems so often that communications is an afterthought and i say that biased as a communications professional uh but but it really does you know we, we've seen the power of just explaining some of these things why is e-consent here why is this device here well it gets this and this done i mean it's it a lot for, for the many of the people on this call or most of the people on this call those like i said those things are probably self-evident but there's a lot of people who i found that you can bring along uh, by just a little more effective communications and, and thinking of it up front rather than at the end. I would, you know, I would suggest that that pervades every part of healthcare too. I mean, communication is at the root of it. Um, Van, you uh, you had a quest or you had a question comment and just introduce yourself. Oh, you're on mute. Hold on. There we go. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, Van Krishnamurthy, I'm an ex-Columbia physician. I was a, I guess, ex Bristol Myers Squibb as well. Um, I have an NYU back startup. We're creating devices for people like me who have visual impairment. Mine's from a rare disease, but um, the common ones obviously are age-related, macular degeneration, and things like diabetic retinopathy, which affect millions of people. So, um, a, a few things. So, part of it is because we use actually we develop ML and AI algorithms 
for our, one of our products that uses external sensors as opposed to internal sensors. So um, a little bit of pushback on the 80 year old using the tablet. I will tell you, elder tech has actually become a buzzword, a hashtag now, because a lot of technology is not designed for people under the age of 30. Um, and so, and I can tell you for me, even though I'm only 42, I can't read the screens of a lot of apps because of my eye disease. So just keep that in mind. I think our, our technology algorithms are only as good as the people designing them and the people designing them have to be diverse enough to um, incorporate into design the various needs of people. Uh, and I think it is skewed more towards people who can see well, who are younger, um, designing products for us for obvious reasons that they're the ones hired. So that being said, my question was, um, is, are we seeing, is Medidata seeing CROs shift or being forced to shift how they bill? Because kind of like in healthcare, we have fee for service, right? Where doctors are billed per service. Um, essentially CROs bill per person and per item and per form. Um, so it seems to me that big pharma has to force CROs to shift, I guess, to a value-based trial system if we want to if you want to share from the healthcare realm before technology, things like remote monitoring, data, data monitoring, entry, all that can actually take off. And so I wanted to see if you're seeing that. Yeah. So let me first address your comment. I, I, I apologize if it came off insensitive about, uh, about the use of technology. I don't, it wasn't, that wasn't intended. Um, the, the, I do fully acknowledge that it's not going to work 100% of the time, all the time for the population, as well as the given study, et cetera, right? Uh, there still is opportunity for education and awareness. And uh, it might be like, you know, in your case, you, you've mentioned, you know, external sensors, et cetera. To me, those are all adoptions of, of technology to better clinical science. So does that does that clarify? Does that make sense? I don't disagree, um, doctor, that that's the that that's the uh, that that the, that there's a challenge there, and I don't think that the challenge is simply age based. I think it's like like you said, it's condition based, and um, and I don't think that I, I think that you're going to have young and old alike, as I was saying earlier, who who might have challenges with the technology, right? I mean, I there are some people who who even though you tell them put it on your finger, um, put it on your index finger, they they can't get that right, right? Like it's just that simple. Um, your your other comment about the CROs. Um, so I, I do sit uh, in, in an industry group with a bunch of um, CROs, and I think uh, just in those conversations, as well as looking at what's being published in you know industry articles, yeah, the CROs have had to reinvent a little bit. Um, and I do think that they're going to have to change their models uh, more broadly in order to accommodate for this. I don't think this is a new topic. Um, I know uh, as an example from a CRO uh, and, and technology space, uh, we've gone to the FDA to talk about risk-based quality monitoring um, topic, which didn't really touch on here, but um, risk-based quality monitoring would also require a change in, in the model. Right uh, in the billing model, because you're going to be looking at a different set of documents, and 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 I think where you're going to shift, quite frankly, is the opportunity to shift shift to more um, more volume, um, more volume as opposed to uh, as opposed to uh, like a, looking at 100% of data. I was just looking. I know I printed it. Um, there was an article that was printed that was um, that was produced uh, that I saw that came out talking about um, shift, uh, um, yes, the FDA will not re require re-monitoring for items monitored remotely during the pandemic. So that should be an indication. So if you did remote monitoring during the pandemic, the FDA is not gonna say you need to go re-monitor, go check those patients again. So that to me would say that ooh, if if CROs or sponsors alike are not or and sites are not figuring out how to readjust, they're going to be left behind. That would be my take. Does that answer your? Does that address your comment? It does. Yes. Thanks. So. Hey Ari, I have a question. Sure. Given this sheer. Uh -oh. What? I said. Uh oh. 
<laughs> Given the sheer number of COVID-19 trials for vaccines and then other therapeutics, is there a danger of not having enough um, people enrolled in these trials um, in order to, you know, get some of these vaccines, given that it seems so hard to recruit patients overall? Um, I, I, if you, so, so if you look at the, um, the latest release of the white paper um, that, that I referenced earlier, the, the number of clinical trials that are going on are and are pretty global for COVID, because I think now there's this race to the cure. So right. I don't, I don't think my this is my this is my own personal sort of opinion. It's not based on, um, it's not based on um, any sort of uh, empirical data. To the to the point that was made earlier, there's such awareness that clinical trials are are out there that. I don't know that enrollment for those trials would be nearly as um, as challenging as enrollment for rare diseases or other places. So, and I'll use my own, again, if a year ago, someone said to me, what do you do for a living? And I, I, I said to them, well, I, I work for a software company that um, uh, provide software for clinical drug trials, people would just roll their eyes and move on because they had no clue what I was talking about. Now, when I say that, oh, so you must be really busy now, right? They, they understand that. So I think that there's much more of an awareness. Um, and again, this has, this has driven awareness, but I think that there's much more awareness of clinical drug trials associated with COVID and therefore, and it's also all over the, the news, right? So I think people will look if they want to get involved um, in doing that. You see that, I think, Bunny, I've seen it with um, um, in the clinical side of plasma donations. People are donating. People who have antibodies are are donating plasma um, because they think that you know it's a good opportunity to help other folks. I don't. I would. I would be very fascinated to see. You know, if you look at the plasma donation statistics pre and post, I would assume that they're probably significantly higher than they've ever been. Bunny, can I chime in? Yeah, please. Sure, Gary Lubin. Um, I I've, I've been on. A lot of sides of clinical trials. I was at Merck 15 years, started and ran um, with my colleagues Merck Capital Ventures. We were an independent VC with one limited partner, Merck Captive Fund. I started a company with uh, with the Mayo Clinic. Um, I, I just started another uh, tech company, among other things. And we've um, known each other for what, like 20 some odd years? Yes, yes. <laughs> we, we've seen us through a lot. So, um, the, um, I speak with sites on a regular basis. One site in particular, a relatively high profile, high, um, well-known site, uh, high performing site, is uh, a starting or has now started COVID studies for in particular. They need, they're looking to get as many patients as they possibly can, and they are struggling to find patients. And you would think that with all of this noise that's out there about the importance, that there would be no problem at all there is a problem. Um, and um, so, um, and, and it, it further gets a little bit complicated because there are certain types of people who are more interested in clinical studies for a whole bunch of reasons we can get into later. But a very big concern is that you're gonna have a, um, a, a sort of a skewed representation of the demographics um, in clinical studies so that when you do get the data, you may not be able to apply the data across all demographics. So you have a whole s another situation. But coming to the point of, of, of the topic question here was, you would think there would be a problem. But right now, with literally hundreds of studies going on, many of them trying to run right into a phase three study, and they're trying to get 30,000 plus, it is, it is very, very challenging. In other countries, it's easier, um, either because of the way the government is structured or the healthcare is structured. Um, you might be able to, we will see Brazil, you know, other countries, it'll be easier to get uh, larger populations of people into studies, but it's a, it's a struggle in certain areas like the United States. Why do you think that? Do you think it's because they're not, they're insisting on traditional approaches of coming into a site or, or uh, awareness? Between like different countries you're talking about? Or? No, 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 in, in the US. Um, so I think, I think part of it is, you know, I'll say, you know, sort of the, the culture, the, the, the uh, some there, are, there is a segment of the population 
that will sign up in a second for um, for study work, um, and they just and it doesn't almost make a difference what it is. They will do it. There's a very large segment of our country that just simply will not enroll in studies, um, and then there are other segments that are I almost say forced into studies. Um, you know, for cancer, for example, there are many people who don't have too many options, and they they take medications which are new that are studies because that's the way they can get treatment. Um, and for a segment of our population, there are a number of people who don't have adequate health care and becoming enrolled in clinical studies give them access to the health care system and helps so they get an opportunity to get health care treatment. Interesting. So, um, Gary, um, wait, sorry. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, wait not... Okay, yeah. Yeah, um, so we, we technically only have two minutes left because we were going to have a hard stop at one. However, um, I'm fine, you know, staying on for another five, 10 minutes, whatever people want to do. Certainly, if you need to go, go. But just wanted to, to let you know. So go just ahead. Before, just before people oh. drop, and I can stay on as well, I just want to have just two, two real quick parting comments. Okay. Um, it's clear that there's a need for technology to have, to have sustainable clinical trials. And it's clear that there's a need for patient centricity and all of this has to happen with patient safety remaining a cornerstone, right? So we can't lose sight of that. If patient safety gets compromised, um, then the whole game is over. But I think realistically, and we've just talked about it briefly here, and of course I'm happy to have a conversation with anyone afterwards um, from, from this, but to me, there is absolutely a need and, and, a, and there is a driving desire um, to have technology, uh, to have technology enablement. So uh, I thank you all for joining um, to, to, to today and happy to continue the conversation. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Ari. Ashish, you want to, what you were going to ask? Yeah, actually, I was just about to say what Gary was mentioning that, um, what the the team who on who started using our platform realized was technology was not sufficient to onboard um, simply because like he mentioned there were few people who quickly onboarded they had the tools and say okay we'll go online and add the data but the rest of them uh, typically were able to onboard because of human relationships like somebody talks to them and convinces them to come on board and then they enable all their tools through technology, they were not able to do it. Uh, tra training was the second part, but just to talking to them, telling them, hey, you have to go online. Do you have a computer where you can do this? It was very, very challenging. The actual operations of the clinical trial was very challenging. And uh, they're still going through that. Now they have to revamp the system in not the operations for that. And it's completely not understood by the, the clinical trials world about technology. I mean, the patients, the physician, there are a lot more people involved as part of bringing them on board. And the resources that are required, um, and to add to what Dr. Van mentioned earlier was, yes, there's a lot more than just, hey, give an iPad to somebody and start capturing clinical data. No. The team has to be involved. The family has to be trained. The stakeholders around the family has to be trained in capturing data. Uh, the intermediary people, so the staff has to be trained because now it's a whole new system. It's not just an EMR where record something and say capture. No, there's inf information because they don't know what the, some other technical details are. And then we had to change the language so that it's more um, closer to the user as opposed to closer to the CROs. And they just didn't think about all of that as ca capturing data. And now all of this is adding to their time and costs and they just didn't think about it. The only part they focused on was regulatory. Will the FDA approve this? And that's it. And the operations part was completely lost. Not that we can't solve it, it's solvable problem, but there's a education communication part which is lost completely in the whole picture. Okay. Thank you. Do you want to comment on that? Uh, I'll quickly add, if I can. So um, thanks for the shout out to me, Ashish. Uh, so, but to add to Ashish and Gary, a um, couple of things. So I'll, I'll add to another demographic uh, that I'm sure Gary knows about is, you know, the black population, many people have a very strong distrust of the healthcare community because of Tuskegee and many other things that have happened. 
So there's a large segment of our country who just, you know, they don't like to be in front of a physician. They don't want to be in the health system. Um, they're not particularly treated well when they're there. So that, that I'll add that. And the other part, maybe, and Ashish, I'm sure you've already thought of this, so, so apologies, but, but you know, Cincinnati Children's, for example, when they, they did a study years back where they showed that AI for recruitment, the value wasn't in the recruitment step. The value was in reducing the number of records that needed to be reviewed in detail um, because the AI would identify inclusion and exclusion criteria. And then it would filter through if you had 100,000 records, you might end up with 100 records that meet the criteria. Because inclusion and exclusion criteria have exponentially grown as drug development has gotten more targeted. So I think that's where the value of the AI and that totally, you know, as so she said, then the, then the human aspect of it comes next. And that's where you can't replace that at this point. And I, I think the shift has to be, we have to talk about AI enabling that end human user and the end human employee as opposed to replacing them. I don't, I think that replacement conversation is getting everything on the wrong track. Yeah. I agree. I, it's okay. not a replacement. Oh. Um, so so yeah. one, one comment, Bunny. Notice that yeah. the title is Technology Enabled, Not Technology Replacement, because I would agree with you a thousand percent, right? We were talking about that, Bunny, right, coming on to a title of this, and I think it's, it's enablement, um, not replacement. There's no, you can't, you cannot replace the human interaction full stop, right? That's just not possible. Um, but the question is, does it, is it, when's it needed? How is it needed? Can, can it be done more judiciously, right? Um, and, and, you know, more selected um, to, to make it work. And just like communication, that it pervades all parts of healthcare and life with technology. So Certainly. with that, Thank you all for the diehards for staying on for so much, such a great conversation, really exciting.